let's talk a little bit about like the future. Like if we got to here and it only took us 20 years, right? Actually it took a, even longer than that in the AI space, but it feels like things are moving really, really fast, right? So if we think about, you know, maybe five years from now or 10 years from now, what do you think is going to be happening? Like what is this current generation or revolution in technology? Like what's going to happen next? Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. I have a few myself because it's come fast. Yeah, it has. You know, that that whole question around, you know, think about uh, the singularity and the elbow of the curve and where are you in that elbow? And, you know, once you enter the curve, you feel like you're in a straight line, but actually things are going to move very differently. It's kind of felt like that a little bit in the past, but now, of course, with the benefit of a few more years of perspective, it just feels like the speed at which the next set of algorithms, the next set of improvements is arriving is much faster. That what we worked on for five years and said, hey, this is a pretty cool improvement in network biology is now, well, in three months, someone's come up with a better version of an LLM or some other kind of AI-based tool that they're deploying against these problems. So I think that's one thing, is that the speed, the acceleration is increasing. That seems uh, evident just last year, how quickly moved uh, things moved last year. So one other aspect that I think will be interesting in the next two or three years is how do these all these different incredibly exciting innovations converge? So I mentioned things around target discovery, things around what we're doing in high-throughput screening, things around AdNet and the other properties of the molecule that make a molecule actually practical. Uh, things about how you actually deliver the molecule to the right cell or cell type. That's really exciting. And that there's been a lot of innovation around that as well. So I think part of what I think is going to happen in the next couple of years, or at least needs to happen in the next couple of years to make this all really impactful, is who's going to aggregate all these different types of technologies uh, to solve these problems. Now, obviously, the big pharma companies are trying to do that, and they have the resources to do that. But I think it will also fall increasingly on smaller, more nimble, innovative companies to partner up with each other. And we're trying to do uh, quite a bit of that at, at Archetype. We have limited bandwidth as a small company, but we're watching these other companies that are bringing other parts of the puzzle from an algorithmic perspective. And then again, I, talking about your company, Xcures, and, and other companies, the data piece. That piece also is accelerating. How, uh, how well can we characterize what's happening in disease? So I've played in gene expression for a long time, but that's not the be all end all. There are all these other omic modalities. There's a spatial aspect to everything that happens in biology. And there's a temporal aspect to everything that happens in biology. And with the cost of all that profiling going down, access to all that data and the ability to do these iterative loops of generate a bunch of data, learn something, test it, take that information from the test, loop it back in, learn a new model, make a new prediction, and so on. These are the types of things that, that I think will and, and need to happen over the next two, three years to see a real impact. I mean, right now, there's a lot of hype around AI drug discovery, and then some of the naysayers will say, well, how many truly AI-discovered drugs are there on the market or even in phase three clinical trials? And that is still pretty limited. I think everything that I just described coming together, both with smaller companies making a purposeful effort to connect the dots and then some of the bigger companies getting access to the pieces, that will ultimately drive a situation where I think you'll just have two things. You'll have much more specific and personalized therapies because it'll be possible to characterize patient groups in a much more fine-grained way. And then a what we've been looking for, which is both an increased speed and a decreased failure rate in late-stage clinical trials. Those are the things that haven't happened yet, despite all the excitement and the hype, and that I think can happen if these pieces get integrated over the next few years. Yeah, I totally agree with you with the hype. I feel like every time I, and I'm a technologist, right, have been my, my whole life. And so I'm really excited about technology. And then I always get called out with like, yeah, but we talked about that for a long time and it didn't actually change anything. And we spent a lot of money on it, right? Developing it in a lot of time and effort. And maybe we should have just done it. Like that's kind of the laggard thinking, right? Which is, or the naysayers, which is just like, yeah, you did a lot of stuff. It was pretty cool, but it didn't do anything. So why did we invest in that? I think your point about convergence is one that resonates a lot with me. And I think about 
as I think about convergence and AI tools, and I'll talk a little bit, you know, I've been doing a lot of work in healthcare, right? And healthcare processing, like just what happens to patients when they try to inter- they try to go to the healthcare system and they don't have their data with them. So how do we get the data just to facilitate the, you know, basic things like going to get a surgery or going to see your doctor or getting treatment for your disease where you have to share information from all sorts of different locations or different provider and healthcare systems. And that data is part of what you're talking about that then becomes kind of core research enablement later, but it often just starts with processes that exist today. I think of things like, you know, you're a new patient at a hospital, they have to get all your data and organize it. Are they getting on a fax machine? Is someone typing it in? What's the AI to stop all that human cost and labor? And when I take those concepts and apply it and start thinking about what I know about drug discovery, right, and development, and that space, to your point, it's kind of a convergence, right? There's the, pro, you know, gene expression, there's all the omics, the spatial components you talked about, the overtime exposure. There's patient, you know, profiling, demographics, history, exposure to in both environmental, socioeconomic influence, right? Like we, we're starting to understand that the world is really complicated. And then there's also all of the stuff I think related to, I think about the hardcore kind of drug delivery. So like material science, um, we're seeing like ultrasound therapies, right? Coming together, like all of these different technologies are coming together. So it's almost like there's all these amazing tools being generated really, really quickly. And I feel like the AI is making them accessible. They used to be only accessible to specialists in a very, you know, discrete high cost environment. But if we've now generalized those and democratized access to, let's say, the best thinking in material science, right, that's going to help us with some drug delivery thing, and the best thinking, it, it starts to put the challenge as not, do I have the right tools, right, or can I get access to the right tools, but can I put together the right pipelines, right, going back to your concept of like, how do we, you know, what is our objective? What's the goal we're trying to get to, right? What are the traditional ways we go for it. What are the bottlenecks along that chain? And then how are we going to get all of this technology, right? And use the right one, right? So it's a question about selection and application. And so, you know, I get, as I think about that, I get really in my heart focused on like, we have all this stuff, like what should we be trying to solve, right? Like what is the fundamental things that are going to have the greatest impact? And I think about impact in the context of kind of really two things. I think of social benefit, right? Personal benefit, like healthcare benefit. And then I think about economics because, you know, we live in a world where economic benefit you do. And I think there's this like intersection of those two, which is kind of like the magic crossover where not only we do good for people, we help cure diseases, right? We develop new drugs and, and but we actually provide economic value to all of the participants. And that's been really elusive right, for a long time, right? If you just think about, great, we have a new drug. Well, who's going to pay for it, right? And who gets access to it? And we have to find a way to balance those two things. And so how do you think about, like, the drug discovering the cost and then bringing these things to market? Do you think there's an opportunity here that we can actually do these things more effectively than in the past? Yeah, I mean, look, first, the the why is super important. And so going back to what you were saying earlier about uh, the your work on the patient side, look, I wish X Cures had been around 15 years ago in the form that it's in now. You know, the, I, I had two friends that I lost, in one in in her 30s and one in her 40s to cancer. You know, and I'm not that old myself. I'm not I'm not 50 yet. So, um, and and so I've been I was in this space when both of, of these friends of mine uh, were diagnosed and so on. One with colorectal cancer and and one with a rare appendiceal cancer, and so. First, they needed some of the stuff that you described. They needed all of their data in one place. I was helping them kind of just grab manual charts together. We were trying to find clinical trials. Now there are all these great companies, x for the patient data, companies like Massive Bio to find a, a clinical trial for them. All that stuff didn't exist 15 years ago, and it does now, thanks to the work that, that you and these other folks are doing. So that's one aspect of it is we can actually do some of that stuff now. Then you got to connect it to, okay, well, as I was saying earlier, do we have the drug for them? Even though we now have a lot of the infrastructure we didn't have before, we may not still have the drug. And to your point, it may not be uh, financially feasible to provide that drug to that person, even if we can identify them, get them, find where they are in which patient cohort, 
find the drug that, that's right for them and so on. Either the drug doesn't exist or, or there's an economic impediment to that. Why are there, there are these impediments? We're not going to solve all these problems, but some of it is just this massive inefficiency that we talked about. 10 plus years, one to $2 billion to produce that one drug. A lot of that is because a lot of the processes that occur are physical along the way. So the screening, if you're doing high throughput screening, that's physical. You got to test 10,000 or 50,000 molecules at the very beginning of that process. Uh, and most of those aren't going to work. You're not casting a wide enough net. You might not be finding the one that does work, and yet you're still spending a bunch of money, for example. Um, and then doing all of that uh, testing in animal models without having ever touched any human data, and then going into a human trial and expecting and hoping that the drug is going to work. So a lot of these things are now addressable and are being addressed by the types of things that we talked about earlier in the conversation. So I do feel optimism that we can squeeze a lot of cost out of it. Now, we don't control all of that. Does that how does that uh, result in better pricing for the drugs and so on? Some of that is out of our hands as a little company, but we can enable that possibility with uh, some of the things that we talked about in terms of making the process faster, more efficient, less late stage failures. That's the, one of the biggest drivers of cost because those trials are really expensive and often the de-risking that can be done through some of these computational approaches has not been done. And then the drug either makes it or it doesn't. And somebody's lost a hundred million dollars in late stage clinical development. And we don't have a drug for those patients. So I think that economic opportunity is there, whether or not the system as a whole you know, makes the right adjustments to pricing to be able to deal with th that aspect of access that you alluded to. I'm not sure, but I think we can make these things less expensive to develop through all of the technologies that we've talked about. Tom, thank you. I have one last question for you. If there was one thing that you and I or others, or that you know of, that people aren't working on, but that you wish that somebody was working on, right? That you'd like someone else, what would that thing in AI be today? Like, what is it that's out there that's missing that somebody should, should try to do? So I'll talk about something that I wish could be done on a grander scale. I do know some folks that are doing it on a smaller scale. So I'll mention what they're doing and then why it should be, do, be happening in a much broader scale across all data. This issue of, and this has hounded me from my days at, at ATIA that we were talking about going back 15 plus years, again, at another then small company fighting this battle where we had these great analytic tools. It was access to the right data to solve these problems. A lot of people have the right algorithms and don't have access to the right data. And so there are some companies that have emerged that are doing a, a really bang up job of grabbing and, and sucking up and hoovering from all the corners of the world, all the relevant data of a particular type. So for example, my friend, uh, Bobby Sieber at Panacent is doing this with single cell data. So they grabbed all largest single cell data repository across human, non-human uh, cell types. That's really important because ultimately, if you're trying to treat a disease, you need to know what cell or cell types you're, you're actually treating the disease in. And often when in cancer, for example, we get these bulk tissue uh, samples and they're a mix of normal, you know, normal uh, uh, cancer cells, uh, immune cells, stromal cells, so on and so forth. So being able to deconvolute all of that, uh, first physically having the data and then being able to use AI to deconvolute companies like uh, that company are solving that. But that's single cell data. What about all the other different types of data modalities out there? I think that the, the AI tool explosion will continue and the ability to readily access the right pertinent data to solve the problem that you're trying to solve is going to increasingly be a question of, can you get the right data in your hands rather than does an AI tool or set of tools exist to do it? So there's a lot of progress in that. You know, we've talked about what your company does and other companies do toward that, but I still think there's a meta layer of connection of all of that that needs to happen. And when that happens, the ability to take what a thousand companies are working hard on from an AI perspective and fully maximize it becomes possible. Mm -hmm.